this means a lot. Um, last year I was able to take a team to a different competition during a pandemic. But as my captain spoke about, to take a group of children from the West Jackson area and expose them to a national competition that is recognized worldwide. The competition is sponsored by Varsity Spirit Brand, which is the largest, largest cheer organization nationwide and actually worldwide. So for them to do the work to earn a bid to such a prestigious competition, it really warms my heart and makes me very proud of these young ladies. We represent our school well because people really don't know that Jim Hill is as great as we are. They look down on us. Um, it is a very exciting experience. Um, I've never been before in all of my four years, so it'll be something new and just something new to try. I was nervous at first coming on because I didn't know like what to expect, even though I had cheered in middle school. But like, I like cheering, it's fun. I like this cheer team. We are what I consider a hybrid squad. So we master what is considered traditional cheer and what's considered stomp and shake cheer. So this national competition is what is considered by some traditional cheer. However, here at Jim Hill High School, everything is tradition for us because we learn, we work hard and we master all forms of competition all forms of cheer so that no matter where we go and where we perform, we can provide uh, the best performance possible. So this competition, it does mean a lot to us because we're able to broaden our horizons and show not just people in the Jackson area, but people in the state and the nation that a group of young ladies from an urban area can compete across genres, across states, across the country. We have the College Fair of 2021, and it's for our seniors, so we have over 1,200 students that ha have been here today, are coming today, and they are visiting um, schools from across Mississippi and the southern region. Schools are here to admit students on the spot. St students have brought their transcripts, college application fee waivers, and they are getting admitted, and they're applying to college today. Um, I like it. It's pretty cool, interacting with the different colleges. I asked a lot of questions about how to apply for scholarships. They told me to fill out the application and they'll get back with me. So I'll let, see how that goes. I think it's a great idea because it's actually giving students who wouldn't have the chance to um, get in contact with these different colleges. It's giving those students a chance to do that. They are here um, being exposed to new people, um, new experiences. I'm just glad that we get to have this experience. I'm glad that they brought this here. And it's an excellent, excellent idea. the United States of America and to the Republic for which you stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, the liberty and justice for all. On behalf of the Shirley Elementary staff and scholars here, we welcome each of you to our renaming ceremony. We are honored that you are sharing this moment in history with us. As we recognize and embrace our new name, this is also an opportunity to reflect on the legacy of our namesake our purpose, and its alignment with the work that we do each and every day. Again, we welcome you and extend an invitation to come further, be a part of the things happening here at Shirley Elementary. Thank you to the Shirley family. It's so wonderful to have you all here as we mark this uh, wonderful occasion. And of course, to uh, Team Shirley and Team JPS, just excited to, um, to be in fellowship with you as well. In Jackson Public Schools, we've, um, we've been pretty intentional about thinking about the importance of names and the importance of identity and um, how important it is for us to uh, name those things that we're proud of um, and to uh, right wrongs or adjust where we feel like there are ways and, and opportunities for us to adjust. We are very intent on teaching history as history happened. 
I'll say that again. We are very intent on teaching history as history happened. There is no effort within Jackson Public Schools to do away with historical events. It's important for us to know where we've been, the things that we've experienced, the things that were great and, and wonderful, and the things that perhaps were difficult and trying. This effort to look again at our namesakes of our buildings and to uh, adjust and to identify opportunities for us to really lift up those individuals in the community who have given so, so much to our community. Uh, we thought it was fitting, uh, one, to look at this school and the namesake here, and then specifically uh, to consider and ultimately to, uh, to have this community to select uh, the Shirley's for all that they've done. Being community uh, servants, uh, being uh, uh, dedicated to education and to health and to all of those things that we know are so, so important for uh, the African American community, but for Jackson and, and beyond, it's just so, so fitting again there. So our effort here is in no way to, uh, to change history or to try to rewrite history. We're teaching all that we need to teach about um, all the historical facts and, and all of the historical figures. And at the same time, this is a very intentional move for us uh, to lift up this wonderful family and lift up the legacy of the Shirley's and, and all that they've done here. Just want to thank this community, want to thank our scholars and the, the team uh, here at Shirley Elementary School, to all of the district leaders and, and our board member, of course, uh, Robbie Luckett and, and our board in general, all of those who saw the need to look again at our namesakes and to support us in this effort. We know that there's lots of conversation all across the country about what should or shouldn't happen when it comes to statues and, and namesakes of buildings and that sort of thing. And we, so, we just so appreciate and we're honored that this community has stood behind us as we've made this shift, as we're making this shift. And I'm excited for this day to look you all squarely in the eye and um, say just how much we appreciate you and appreciate what um, doctors surely have, um, have done for this community. Some are on the line. I just uh, ask why I was on the show. Okay.
Are we ready to go? We can. Okay. The Jackson Public School Board is meeting is now called to order. Board members, we have a quorum. Um, we have four members present in the boardroom, and I believe we have one member on the phone. Is that right, Ms. Williams? And that is Dr. Harrison. Uh, we have all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Mr. Figures has second. All in favor? Aye. 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 There being no nays, the motion is approved. We have all had an opportunity to review the minutes outlined. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes as presented? So moved. Second. Mrs. Johnson has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nays, there being none, the motion is approved. And just like that, we're on to the superintendent's report. Dr. Green. We'll begin as we typically do with the um, video highlights reel from our instructional television crew. Dads, we need you. Hi, I'm Jamari Norris at JPS Dad. My dad is next to me. Did you know that scholars with involved fathers have stronger verbal skills than those with less involved fathers? My daddy helps me when they hurt. That's right, that's right. I'm Hyers County Sheriff Tyree Jones. Dads, we need you. My dad teaches me right from wrong. Did you know that when dads like you are involved in their children's education, our scholars not only perform and behave better in school, they're less likely to be arrested for juvenile crime, do drugs, or join gangs. I'm Mitch McAfee and I'm a JPS dad. Dads, we need you. Did you know that children with highly involved dads in their life receive higher grades and perform a year above their expected age level on achievement tests? My dad is my role model. He works hard every day to support me and our family. Hello, I'm Dr. Andrew Clark, a proud JPS dad. My dad is my best friend. He teaches me about sports and life. Did you know when dads are engaged in children's education, Grades and test scores improve, attendance increases, and students are more involved in school activities. Dads, we need you. Calling all JPS dads and male role models. Please save the date, Saturday, February 5th. We will be hosting a summit at Forest Hill High School from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. The theme is a dad's health is a school's wealth. You will receive free medical checks and learn some helpful tips on maintaining a healthy lifestyle. We look forward to your presence. Awesome job. High five. High <laughs> <laughs> <You're> five. <laughs> See, you are always playing. Each month, the JPS administration honors principals who exhibit the core values of equity, excellence, growth mindset, relationships, relevance, and a positive and respectful culture. Congratulations to the following educators on being named January's Administrators of the Month. Dr. Sarah Harper, Principal of McWillie Elementary School, Division One. Dr. Harper works hard to ensure student growth for students in the Montessori and Pre-K program. Dr. Yolanda Lloyd, Principal of John Hopkins Elementary School, Division Two. Dr. Lloyd has a wealth of knowledge with subject area content, learning strategies, and ensuring teaching and learning is relevant in the classroom. Mr. Kevin L. Culver, Principal of Northwest Jackson Middle School. He believes that scholars should be able to apply the knowledge acquired from effective lessons to real world challenges. Mr. Tory Hampton, Principal of Forest Hill High School, also known as the University of South Jackson. Their school community has seen increases in academics, teacher retention, and graduation rates. Congratulations to all of our wonderful school leaders. Congratulations to high school senior Jalea Ritas for receiving nearly two million in academic scholarship offers from nearly two dozen schools. 
Ritas is currently enrolled in the Jackson Public Schools Tougaloo Early College High School. Her home school is Jim Hill. She plans to attend a historically black college or university. Ritas will graduate high school with her associate's degree. Her hundreds of hours of community service, along with being a good scholar, were keys to securing her scholarship offers. JPS scholars enrolled in the simulation and animation design program at the Jackson Public Schools Career Development Center created a national award-winning app for the 2021 Congressional App Challenge. Michael Collette, Avery Johnson, Michaela Nelson, all won first place in the competition, while Jamarian Gibson, Jalen Reeves, and Nicholas Reeves won second place. Congressman Benny Thompson, US House of Representatives for Mississippi's 2nd Congressional District will recognize these scholars for their achievement. This is the fifth consecutive year that scholars from this program have received recognition for winning first place in this national challenge. This year's winning app called Candle is designed to help people who struggle with social anxiety and other related disorders, primarily in their teenage years. Jim Hill cheerleaders awarded an opportunity to compete in the national cheer competition at the National High School Cheerleading Competition in Orlando, Florida. Hosted by the Universal Cheerleaders Association, the Tiger Cheerleaders competed in a virtual regional competition in December 2021 in order to earn a bid. The work that these young ladies put into their performances uh, and to their skill set uh, epitomizes what we want of every athlete at Jim Hill High School. The MHSCC competition takes place at the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex at Walt Disney World Resort on February 11th through the 13th, 2022. The cost to attend this competition, including registration fees, transportation, and lodging, is approximately $16,000. You can make a donation through a GoFundMe page created by the Jim Hill Booster Club at www.gofundme.com slash tiger-cheer-takes-disney. Donations can also be made by contacting the Booster Club at tigercheerboosterclub at gmail.com. Parent Teacher Conference Day will be held Monday, February 14, 2022 at all JPS schools. There will be no school for scholars. Schools will be open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. for parents to meet with teachers to discuss their scholars' progress. The Jackson Public Schools Board of Trustees meetings are broadcast live every first and third Tuesday, <coughs> except otherwise noted, on JPS ITV Comcast Channel 19. The district also provides a live caption simulcast of the meeting for the hearing impaired. Watch live caption Board of Trustees meetings at youtube.com slash JPS ITV. The district's official mobile app is now available. Get access to news, the district's directory, and much more. Download it on Google Play and from the Apple Store. Search for Jackson Public Schools MS. For more information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website at www.jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools and on Twitter at JPS District. As always, we want to thank our instructional television uh, team for their work on uh, that video and bringing us those highlights. Um, board members, I have several remarks this evening. I'll try to keep each of them brief, but um, quite, a, quite a lot happening in our district that uh, I think is important for us to highlight here. First, as everyone knows, we're continuing to experience some major uh, challenges with the city's water infrastructure, um, and with water pressure uh, not being sufficient to um, uh, meet our needs in several of our schools and largely uh, uh, located in the um, southern uh, uh, portion of, of town. And so we do still have schools uh, even going into uh, tomorrow uh, that will remain uh, virtual. Um, schools, uh, they're all middle schools, so three middle schools, Peoples, 
well, two middle schools, Peoples and Witten Middle School, and Wingfield High School, unfortunately, must remain uh, virtual. But I am pleased to announce that um, our team has been able to work with schools um, and, and some of the neighboring schools to find alternative locations for three of our elementary schools. And so Wilkins Scholars will be relocated to Van Winkle. Our key scholars, key elementary scholars, will be relocated to Johnson Elementary. And Marshall Scholars will be relocated to Lake Elementary. Again, that's Wilkins going to Van Winkle, Key going to Johnson Elementary, and Marshall Elementary going to Lake Elementary. And that's, um, this is a, hopefully a temporary uh, relocation um, just to get us over a hump and, and we're hopeful that the, the, um, the work that the city is doing will at least get us to the point where uh, most, if not all, of these schools can come back online uh, in their own spaces. So those three elementary schools will be relocated, again, Peoples and Witten Middle Schools and uh, Wingfield High School. Unfortunately, those three schools must remain virtual. And we'll just continue to work with, um, as we have been with the city, to get the latest information and, and uh, try to make pivots as, po as much as possible. I want to thank you to all of our scholars, to all of our parents, and other community members who've helped us to weather this, this storm. Um, I know it's been really taxing on, on uh, several school communities and several families, and so we are very thankful uh, to everyone for the work that they've done just to help us all get through it. Um, and for sure, thankful to our school leaders and our teachers and other team members within those schools who have been flexible and um, just dealing with every curveball that's been thrown at them. So thanks again to the entire team and community. Board members, we, we haven't um, uh, spoken to this uh, uh, in the last few weeks, I don't think, or a few meetings, and so wanted to just give you uh, publicly an update on our COVID numbers. Now, we do weekly, as you all know, we do provide updated data on our website, um, on our um, COVID dashboard, but just wanted to uh, make some notes here. First off, we, as you all know, we are continuing to utilize as many of the strategies to try and keep everyone safe and trying to keep our schools in person. It's a bit ironic that we've been able to ward off um, high numbers of COVID cases and, and, and whatnot with our teams and maintain in-person instruction, but for some of the water woes that we've had. So a bit ironic that we're dealing with that, but such is our situation. So for um, the period, reporting period of January the 6th, so just after we came back from the winter holiday, from January 6th through uh, the 28th, this past week, um, our January positive cases for staff members um, totaled 53. And for students, our scholars, totaled 93 positive cases. As compared to December numbers where staff members, there were 16 positive cases. And 67, I'm sorry, positive student cases. 16 positive student cases versus, um, and, and 67, I'm sorry, I've got this flipped around. 16 staff cases and 67 student cases. So let me say that again. January 53 for staff, 93 for students. In December, 16 for staff, 67 for students. Those are positive cases. And just by, for comparison's sake, going back to August, for staff, there were 25 positive cases. So we started school the first month, 25 positive cases for staff, and 138 positive cases for students. And from what we've seen from our numbers and what we're hearing from um, health officials, the, the Delta variant seemed to peak around August, early September. And so, um, um, you know, you see the, the cases that we had then. Um, and the, the um, Omicron variant uh, seemed to peak late December, 
no, late, late January, late January. And so the December numbers, again, with staff 16 and students 67, and then the um, positive cases in January of 53 and 93 staff and students. So just wanted to share those numbers with you. Again, that the information from this last uh, reporting period is on, and the, the trailing information that we've been gathering is on our website. Folks can go there to see it. Um, we have continued our work and actually intensified our work with Maverick Health. Um, they've been providing testing uh, to our, our um, members of our community. Um, they have provided testing directly to our team members who, um, who are not vaccinated um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and as well to our scholars who, uh, whose parents have consented for testing and our scholars who are playing in sports and, and, and all of that. So we are uh, appreciative of them and for their work. Um, we, we do allow scholars to be tested at the employee sites, which are Watkins Elementary and uh, the Teacher Resource Center right here. That's Mondays through Fridays, 12 to 5, um, if they have the consent forms um, completed. And, and those con consent forms can be gathered from our, our website or from schools. Um, Obviously, the, the strongest, we believe, the strongest uh, way to fight against the, the, um, the virus is to have uh, folks uh, vaccinated. And so we are continuing our efforts to uh, provide vaccination opportunities. And so the next uh, vaccination blitz <clears throat> that will be available to um, our scholars, our staff members, or even community members will be on uh, Tuesday, February the 15th from 8.30 until 2.30. I believe that's, yep, that's listed there on the board. Um, and on Tuesday, the sites will be Kirksey Middle School and Cardozo uh, and Bates, Cardozo Middle School, Bates Elementary, 8.30 until 2.30 on February the 15th. And then that Wednesday, February 16th, again, 8.30 until 2.30, the sites will be Northwest IB Middle and the Career Development Center. And so we've tried to move those sites, um, have those sites stood up in different areas of town, <clears throat> of town to be more available to our scholars and, and staff and, and family members. Um, so again, I wanted to share this information with you. I, I did mention, and I want to go back and, and reemphasize, we, uh, we've been working with Maverick for um, some on-site testing, of Maverick Health, with some on-site testing of our various team members. We're also participating in the third phase of testing with the Mississippi Department of Health. Um, and so during that phase, test kits are made available to school districts. Uh, kits have been ordered and are being delivered to our Office of Climate and, and Health and Wellness. Um, and so staff in the office will, will distribute those uh, kits out to schools according to positive cases and number of close contacts and that, that whole deal. And so we're striving to continue to, to both provide vaccination opportunities for those who might need it as well, increased testing. We know that it's likely with increased testing that you'll find more individuals, but that's actually a good thing. And so we want to know if anyone happens to be, especially if they're uh, asymptomatic, anyone happens to be positive, um, just so that that can be addressed. So anyway, wanted to share that information with you, wanted to encourage all of our families and community members to visit our website for additional information there, um, and uh, obviously to reach out to their schools or to our, um, our central office if they have any questions about our continued efforts to maintain safety and to continue our scholars in learning. <clears throat> and now, uh, just a few more updates just to share with you. I've mentioned previously and want to uh, just extend my sincere thanks to all of our school leaders uh, within Jackson Public Schools. I've, um, I've met with each of our principals um, this month over the last uh, several weeks in on a in a one on one meeting just to review their goals, their data. Uh, see, picture of one of my. 
amazing school leaders who was being bum rushed and, and when we announced that uh, this was our principal of the year, principal uh, Dr. Evans. Anyway, so I met with our principals one on one uh, to, to review their, their goals, the data and, and progress towards their goals and um, the strategies that they're implementing to reach their goals. And they've got goals, uh, academic goals as well as culture goals, whether it's attendance or behavior or um, some, some of them are looking at uh, satisfaction data on, on um, uh, uh, surveys and uh, several other different ways to think about culture, how to retention of, of staff, retention of scholars, all of those sorts of things. And so just excited by those conversations, excited by the leadership in our district. Um, and I do want to especially uh, call out the fact that even in the midst of these water woes and continued cha challenges there, all of the logistics around trying to keep us all safe and, and keeping schools open, that our school leaders have the, the clarity of mind just to engage in conversations around teaching and learning at this time, given all that's on their plates. And so um, I just, for those of you who aren't in that work all day, every day, know that this is huge, that our school leaders and our teams are not just focusing on, you know, COVID, 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 as important as that is, they're actually utilizing this time to move our scholars academically. And so I just, huge thanks to all of those uh, team members, all of those leaders, and all of their teams for the work that they're doing every day. All right. I would like to ask at this time if the, um, the Jim Hill cheer coach, Tamika Harris, and the Jim Hill cheer squad, uh, I just want to ask them to please come forward. See, they're all, all, all squatted up, <laughs> ready to show out. So board members, if, as you heard in our video earlier, the award-winning Jim Hill Tiger cheerleaders recently earned the distinguished privilege of competing at the National High School Cheerleading Championship in Orlando, Florida. It is my distinct honor to recognize these amazing scholar athletes who are living out our core value of excellence. And since you're here and since you happen to have your pom-poms, I mean, are we, are we prepared to show the people what we've got? I'm asking too much. Did I put you on the spot? I did. You're always ready? <laughs> something told me you would say something like that. <laughs> You don't have to get ready. <laughs> just, just give us a little taste of something.
they can move in front of us. Yeah. Uh, okay. Members, you'll, you'll uh, recall or you'll note that it's been a while since we've had young people to come um, and actually perform or share uh, that work with us. We've had our, um, our scholar representatives to come and speak. And so it's nice to add more of our scholar uh, talent and experiences to these meetings. Um, and again, to the entire Jim Hill community, want to thank them for their hard work uh, to the cheer squad and to the cheer coach. Um, I know that we'll all be rooting for them as they go to the national competition. And, and, and um, I'm also told, and I guess they can go to our website to support, um, there's, a, there's a GoFundMe um, a campaign. And so um, there's an opportunity to, to support the uh, Booster Club. And, and so we obviously want to make sure that we're supporting them as much as possible. Give me one second. Okay, and now um, one of our team members, board members, uh, was recently honored by Congressman Benny Thompson um, back in November of 2021 in the House of Representatives after being nominated by a JPS scholar. This team member has received numerous accolades from various organizations uh, for their leadership, loyalty, service, uh, and service in public education. This uh, team member is the recipient of the Amos Wright Award for Superior Academic Performance and the Outstanding Leadership and Recognition Award. It gives me great honor um, and is a huge privilege of mine to present this first Superintendent's Golden Apple award to the one and only Lakeisha Marshall Thomas. Come forward, Ms. Thomas. Those of you who know Mrs. Marshall Thomas, you know what a force she is. But you probably also know that she's going to be the last one to seek any kind of recognition. So makes it even more special that we're able to, to provide this uh, first golden apple to her. Board members we, and community members, we will be uh, recognizing someone at, every, I believe, at every meeting, at every meeting going forward. In a district this large, with such a large school uh, community, there's so many people doing so much good work and, and, and um, doing so much to, to support our scholars and our schools. And so we do want to uh, make sure that we carve out time to recognize those individuals and to give them their flowers. So again, congratulations, Mrs. Marshall Thomas. And lastly, board members, um, I know we've had some lengthy discussions in the past about the comprehensive land use study. 
Um, and we've had some presentations and, and we've been talking about the, the way forward. And so I wanted to let you know that um, we are planning to bring back to you a formal, an act, a formal a proposal for that work um, with a recommendation for approval. And hopefully we'll be prepared to do that at the next meeting. But in the next uh, meeting or two, we'll be coming to you with a formal proposal. This important study is likely to take, as we've discussed previously, um, more than 12 months uh, to do the kind of engagement with the community and, and um, data gathering and, and just all of the various components of the study. Um, and with initial findings likely to be available um, for us along the way. But during that time, I also wanted to signal to you that the administration, as we receive um, requests or proposals or suggestions for the good use of our buildings or properties that the administration uh, administrative team and I will consider viable offers uh, for lease or for sale of properties um, and make some recommendations to the board for action uh, as we deem appropriate and as the opportunities might warrant more timely consideration and not waiting uh, perhaps until the end of the study. Obviously, at the end of the day, the board um, you know, will make a recommendation and, and, um, and you will determine if that makes sense or if you're compelled by those recommendations. But I did want to signal to you, and I know we've had um, folks to come previously to board meetings and, or, or to submit uh, in writing to board members um, some suggestions for the use of, of the, those properties. So just wanted to signal that, that yes, we're uh, looking forward to coming to you with an, uh, a formal proposal for the uh, comprehensive land study work and understanding that that study will likely take more than 12 months uh, in the time being. In the meantime, we will um, consider viable options that are presented to us and, um, and make recommendations as we see fit from that. Uh, Dr. Sivak, that concludes my remarks for this evening, unless there are questions um, or comments from board members with regard to any of that. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, I guess the only comment I'll make is that uh, thank you for bringing students back into the boardroom and doing it safely. And uh, thank you for having the Jim Hill squad be the first group to come. That, that's a credible opportunity. And, and let's do everything we can to support them on, on making sure that trip happens. And um, so again, let's, uh, thank you. All right, board members, um, we will continue with our uh, agenda. Um, we will now move on to public participation. Um, I did receive a note that we do have several people who have um, submitted, uh, signed up to comment. Um, just let me remind the community that uh, community members who would like to make public comments should email their request to Ms. Rosalind Williams at roswilliams at jackson.k12.ms.us no later than 4 p.m on the day of the meeting. Uh, so with that, uh, Attorney Turner, I believe you've got the list. Yeah. Board members, the first person who signed up to address you is Leroy Walker, Jr. He wants to address you, um, I believe as a member of the site council, remarks about Powell Middle School. Great, and just to remind um, people making public comments, uh, you will have three minutes to make co public comments. Uh, the board will not respond to comments we do um, encourage them, and uh, if you have not had a chance yet to speak to the principal or administrator um, within uh, that is oversight of the issue raised, we encourage you to do so. Oh, good evening. Uh, Mr. Walker, one sec. And um, also, uh, in addition to the three minutes, that one minute, Attorney Turner will just sign a signal one minute left. So thank you, Mr. Walker. The yellow card, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, how you all doing? Good. Uh, hadn't seen you in a while uh, to see back, but you and I were together when we did the bond referendum mm -hmm. and uh, trying to get the community together as it relates to the passage of it, and we did very, very well. Uh, I come to you with some concerns and, of which I would like for you to look at. Uh, you should have a copy of them. If you don't, uh, I'll be happy to get it, get it for you. Uh, I'm the chairman of the site 
council at the Powell Middle School, we meet on a monthly basis. And sometimes we meet uh, every other week. It depends on what's needed. Uh, standing to my right is a most astute uh, individual who works with me as well, Ms. Gwendolyn uh, Chase. Chess, I'm sorry. Uh, you have in front of you some items of which I would like to bring to your attention. I have uh, had conversations with uh, your facility operational individuals. Uh, I have also uh, had conversations with uh, one of the board members who is associated with that particular district uh, to make sure I, we were all calibrated. Uh, I didn't want uh, Mr. Albright or Ms. Uh, Sandra Robinson to be uh, stonewalled in terms of the things that we do have here. I also have been fortunate enough to have a relationship with uh, uh, Dr. William Merritt, and I made sure that Dr. Merritt was aware as well. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. McGinnis is the principal at Powell Middle School. I think she's doing an outstanding job. And I personally think that there are some things that we have on the radar from the site council that we would like for you to pay attention to. And these things I would like to raise and elevate the level of concern uh, going forward. I will not read them because I only have three minutes and she's going to raise that yellow card in a minute. <laughs> but uh, the restrooms, the windows, the doors, the lights, uh, the leaks that we have seen as well, uh, uh, the, uh, the towel on the floor, uh, the science lab, some painting, as well as uh, there is a concern from the site committee as it relates to gang related issues that seemingly are mushrooming in the community. Uh, I would like for you to uh, have a conversation, if you don't mind, deeper conversation with how can we allocate more dollars toward these things that are needed. Clearly, we need safety in the school. We need to make absolutely sure that these things are repaired. Uh, that is the role of the site council, which is to look at the things in the school that needs to be corrected. Uh, we were hoping that an individual would be appointed uh, who is supposed to monitor, if you will, uh, the, the bond money that is supposed to flow, but unfortunately it has not been appointed as, yet, as of yet. I understand it might be Ms. Donna McLaurin, but I'm not sure if that's going to be the person in charge. But, uh, from, my, from my understanding, there hadn't been any representation, and we need to make sure we have representation for those schools. Be happy to answer the question because I know she's going to raise the card in a minute. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Next, Mr. Roderick Red wants to address you regarding Midtown Charter School. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Uh, my name is Roderick Red. I'm here on behalf of the Business Association of Midtown, uh, of which I serve as the president of the uh, board. Uh, the Business Association of Midtown uh, started in 2012. It was, uh, it was formed so we can work on collaboration and expansion and enhances uh, goodwill between businesses and residents. Uh, I opened up a business uh, about 10 years ago and moved it into Midtown in 2015. Um, and uh, since being in Midtown, I, I'm obviously the president of the board. And uh, I'm here to, to um, just present you guys with a letter of support from the Business Association of Midtown for on behalf of Midtown Partners. Uh, it was our local neighborhood nonprofit um, that has uh, the Midtown Charter School in our neighborhood. And uh, we just want to drop off this letter of support too recognize that we uh, support Midtown Partners in their uh, efforts to uh, work with you guys to uh, either lease Rowan or um, uh, Brown uh, that are currently located in our neighborhood and are uh, currently uh, not being used at the moment. Um, I specifically support these two because I just recently purchased um, a building in Midtown of which uh, used to be owned by Midtown Partners and now we bought it from them. Uh, we benefited greatly from um, organizations like Midtown Partners who uh, brought in my business when it was small. It was a small incubator creative space, uh, allowed my business to, you know, to flourish and grow in that space, big enough to be able to purchase that building. So now we're invested in the neighborhood. 
so much so I bought a home in the neighborhood as well. Um, I'm born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. I'm a JPS scholar, graduated from her high school all the way through. And um, I you know, lived in the neighborhood, brought my business to the neighborhood, brought commercial property in the neighborhood, and I want to see the neighborhood flourish alongside with the board of directors and other people in Midtown. So um, anytime there's a possibility or an opportunity for an organization like Midtown Partners to utilize the, the area, we, we have the charter school there, and I, I know they can use it to um, to, to grow and to move in those spaces, especially if it's, you know, sitting empty. We, we want 100% support uh, any efforts in there. We hope that you guys would look into that if they want to put forth a proposal to utilize either one of those buildings. In that meantime, we, as a board, um, totally um, support that. So um, that's, that's what I had to say. Thank I'll, you, Mr. Red. Yeah, and I'll do yeah. Next, Mr. Philip Brown wants to address you to speak on behalf of Midtown Charter School. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Philip Brown. Uh, I'm currently uh, just came back to Midtown Partners. Uh, I'm the food director over the charter school. Prior to uh, actually startup. I started with it. I was born and raised in the Midtown area, which was prior known as, um, we called it uh, North End, right. <laughs> I was a youngster coming up through there. But all of the great things that are going on over there um, is unbelievable. And I'm asking the board to consider um, the usage of the Brown or Rowan through the charter school. Um, because, well, Midtown Partner has just flourished that area. And I appreciate what they are doing. As we know, our city is lost in many ways. And um, it's kind of, I'm passionate about, that's why I'm a little, I'm very passionate about my community. My church is there on Seatway, New Strangers Home. I'm a deacon there. Um, and I appreciate what they are doing. It's so many things that you guys don't know. Uh, Dr. Christian Hendricks and Monica Cannon, I mean, they're endlessly, the time that they put in. It, it is not on record. I can tell you that it's not on record. So I'm just asking you to consider you know, that, you know, whatever y'all decisions are, you know, that that is an opportunity not to just let that area just go vacant, those buildings go vacant, you know. And they, they have an open door policy. You know, anybody can come and offer, you know, advice or suggestions or so forth to, you know, to utilize, you know, that area. So I appreciate what they're doing and I'm a part of it and, um, Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Phillip. Excuse me, Mr. Brown. No, I was just saying thank you. I called you Mr. Phillip, but it's Philip Brown. Thank you. <laughs> Dorothy Jones is next, I believe, to address you for regarding vacant schools. See my baby, your baby, he over there eat. But listen, I can only hold so much. We need them schools. Midtown need them. We need space for our babies. We've been waiting ever since 17. We've been waiting for five years. I bought it when they closed it. I didn't understand. I bucked. I bucked, okay? But then I also know that time brings about a change. Okay? With that being said, we need somewhere, either one of those buildings, for these kids to go. We got them closed up. The windows are being broken. Okay? 
What's going to happen when they start going in there finding all kinds of sort of stuff? The drug havens, it's open. Those buildings are open for that. Okay? Let's put them to use. For some positive use. Okay? Is it, you know, what can I say? I want to see, I want to be around long enough to see a change. Excuse the phone, y'all. Okay. <laughs> but this, we need to change. We need to build this. The space is for our babies. It's so much crying. It's so, I just could stand in my back door and say, look, look, at them hiding their drugs. At them sitting on the steps in the back of me smoking their drugs. Look, okay? And my mom said, if it happened in front of your house, you're coming in there, all right? So let's give them somewhere else to go, somewhere positive, some positive to do, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Miss Jones. Next is Monica Cannon, who wants to speak to you regarding vacant schools. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, as you know, schools and churches are some of the most important anchors of a community. Midtown is no different. Brown Elementary and Rowan Middle Schools were two, not one, two of the anchors for us. In 2017, it was very difficult for the community to come to grips with JPS closing Rowan and a year later closing Brown. The interim superintendent at that time and your predecessors held a meeting in Midtown and, and asked for our support in closing those schools. We did not want that to happen. We expressed it, but we did give the support and they made promises to us. They promised us the building would not be, uh, the building, um, they promised us the building would not be vacant like Poindexter was at that time. Poindexter is in use now, but at that time it said vacant. They promised us the building would not, would be maintained and not become an eyesore. They promised us the next building occupants would provide a service or services to benefit our community. That, that was in 2017. We are still waiting on the fulfillment of those promises. Our community is more than houses, it's more than buildings and businesses. Our community is a direct result of hard work by all of our stakeholders, residents, businesses, organizations, institutions. Midtown Partners is one of those stakeholders and has been for over 25 years. We've been partners with JPS for over 25 years. People that you see in this meeting that represent Midtown, we've served on site councils in both of the schools. We financially supported both of the schools. I graduated from Rowan, grew up in, in the Fair Street area. So I'm very familiar with the community. And we just have invested financial resources, but sweat equity in re revitalizing our community. And I just wanna share with you all Recently, we tore down 16 vacant houses, a, throw, a stone throw away from both of those schools. That was a $200,000 initiative. We're getting ready to invest $10,500,000 in building 30 plus houses, affordable houses for families in that community. It makes no sense in us doing that when right around the corner, two schools are boarded up and sitting vacant. That makes no sense. And so we're just asking you all to support us in supporting the community in uh, making those schools available for use. Midtown Partners is one applicant, of course, but you have many others. And it doesn't matter who gets the use of the buildings, we just need them to be used. We need them to be used for our babies. You wouldn't want two schools. Other communities have one school, but we have two. And I just thank you all for giving us a moment of your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cannon. Um, and finally, you have Alexandria Drake, the JPS Tougaloo Early College High School. 
uh, wants to address you regarding student feedback on the January 28th MDE public hearing concerning change in social studies standards. I believe it's a group of scholars who collectively want to address you. Good evening. We were uh, prepared for a little bit longer, but we thought it was important that our students became engaged in this process about decisions being making, uh, make, decisions being made regarding change to our social studies curriculum. And they attended the hearing, and they had some thoughts that they wanted to share. So, Ms. Dre. And Dr. Evans, I believe I see eight scholars, and three times eight is twenty-four. Yeah. And what I'm saying <laughs> is, you got twenty-four minutes. If y'all take less time. That is fine, but we want to make sure we hear from each of you. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Thank you so much. We were prepared to, to rush through this. But my name is Alexandria Drake. I'm a U.S. history teacher at the JPS Tougaloo Early College High School. And so on Friday, I invited my students to attend the um, hearing put on by the Mississippi Department of Education concerning changes being made to the social studies um, curriculum. And there are two reasons why I invited my students to attend. One, um, teachers are encouraged to show students the standards and objectives that they're supposed to master at the end of the unit or to prepare for their test. And so I wanted to invite my students to see the process behind and the forces and opinions that shape those objectives. The second reason is I wanted to um, connect that process to national conversations around what is being taught in our social studies classroom. So as you guys are aware, um, we had legislation on the state level to ban critical race theory in our classrooms. Um, and also, the public had raised concerns about changes being made to the social studies standards here in Mississippi. And so I'll show some of the examples of some standards that might have been or might be changed. And these are middle school standards. So as you see up here, uh, the standards or the information that's crossed out is um, information that will be removed from the standards. And so some of the concerns were that key civil rights leaders that um, we want to make sure that our students are aware of would be removed from some of the standards. MDE has said that they would include this information and add it back, but we want to make sure that our standards are not too broad and that teachers actually know what to teach and that there's a standard across the board so students know and should know what they um, what is going on in the civil rights era. So my students are going to share, um, this is what we expected to see at the meeting, discussions about these specific standards um, dealing with civil rights, but my students are going to share what they heard, what they felt, their reactions to what was going on in the meetings, and then they're also going to give um, J some action steps and what they want to see moving forward um, as it relates to social studies um, in Jackson. So, Ms. Davis? That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Good evening. Thank Good you evening. for having me. Good evening. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm kind of nervous. Um, I'm Lindsay, and a thing that I noticed at the hearing was definitely lack of diversity. It was definitely a minority and a majority. <coughs> And a minority was like people who would be impacted by the removal of the civil rights standards and they were not there to represent themselves. And the thing that my um, principal, Dr. Evans, told me was it's up to us to read up on stuff like that. And I feel like we as minorities should represent ourselves and be at the table when it comes to topics like this. Mm -hmm. okay. um, good afternoon. Well, good evening, I should say. Um, as Lindsay Davis was saying, my classmate, the minority versus the majority in the board meeting room was um, overwhelming. I think we were one of like, we were really the only group of African Americans there, not to make this a race thing, but we were um, some of the only minorities there. And then you go into the tone of the hearing, um, it was really aggressive and intimidating, so it sort of made you feel like, wait, don't say anything, be quiet. If you clap for um, someone that may not be um, speaking the majority opinion, which the majority of them were um, of a different race or of a different political stance or something like that, um, you sort of felt um, the need to stay quiet or you would be like isolated and your views wouldn't be taken as seriously. And it sort of raises the question, if we want to foster leaders in our students, how are we going to do that when they're told to stay quiet and not speak up? Something else we noticed was a push for patriotism. Many of the speakers talked about the Constitution and how they wanted to see it in the light of its um, original form. 
Also, we saw a lot of them push for Christian values. As we know, a couple of decades ago, prayer was taken out of schools for reason, but they wish, they wish for it to be back in. Also, many of, our, many of the speakers there made critical race theory the same as social, social and emotional learning curriculum, which many of our teachers were taught this year. Good evening. Something else that I noticed was that it was a push for us to be seen as just Americans instead of seeing our American differences. Something else was there was a concern that certain labor unions were omitted from parts of the standards. Good evening. My name is Jamari Severick. And just to conclude the uh, general uh, uh, thoughts that we had um, from the hearing, um, since race is uh, believed to be one of the um, DNA embedded within the uh, formation of our nation, we can evade those origins if we do not become more polarized in our beliefs and we become set in our beliefs and don't, uh, and aren't open to compromise. And if we aren't open to that compromise and unifying with one another and doing things to benefit majority, if not all of uh, the people who this may impact, this could lead to more civil unrest and more aggression. Good evening. My name is Ariana Brunfield. And one of the major things that I noticed while listening to the speakers that were registered to speak at the hearing was that many of them that decided to speak on the critical race theory and preventing it from being involved in school curriculum was that they didn't have a correct definition of the term. And while doing research following the hearing, I did research on the legislation that has recently been passed in Mississippi dealing with the critical race theory. And um, I noticed that the critical race theory wasn't correctly defined in the legislation. And it states that in that legislation that critical race theory is the idea that one student is superior to another based on their race. But as you can see, the critical race theory is correctly defined as the core idea that a race is a social construct and that racism is not merely the product of individual bias or prejudice, but also something embedded in legal systems and policies. Mm -hmm. Um, my name is Ariel Brunfield, and moving forward, we want to take some action steps, and we ask that we're kind of giving, you know, input on these educational decisions that's being made because they do impact us very heavily, and that students who want to, you know, have our voices heard and have a say in what's going on. And we also want the curriculum and standards to be more specific because with it being so vague, teachers have, you know, they don't really have a set, you know, guide on what to teach, and it can also create leeway for bias and you know when we go to take the state test you know what do we do when different students know different things mm -hmm. and we also want to be seen in the curriculum and represented you know with our culture and our history because as we've seen in places like the hearing our, our history and our culture is kind of being challenged so we want to be represented and we also want to be encouraged to think critically you know gaining our own opinions and our own thoughts instead of you know just following others and you know following what a teacher might say so we want to be able to you know gain our own thoughts and opinions. Um, good evening, my name is John Anna Estrus. And moving forward, we also want to be allowed to find a balance between patriotism, our love for this country, but also questioning this country's past. What was this country founded upon? And what direction are we moving as a country? And are we okay with that? I also ask that more schools get involved in forums such as this so their voices may be heard. I ask that this school board generally consider supporting the retention of civil rights standards as they are this year, and also just genuinely question what we have asked of you. I also ask that for other students to join us in responding to MDE's request for written feedback regarding proposed changes to the standards, so that our voices are heard as students as these are standards being taught to us that we will be tested on. Thank you. What do you say? But well, we just invite everyone, um, you can submit your feedback concerning the standards. I'd encourage everyone to look through the standards. Um, written feedback is still being accepted until February 4th, this Friday, and you can send that feedback to the email address you see on your screen or um, mail it uh, to the MDE or the Mississippi Department of Education. Thank you so much. Well, it's a good thing nobody had to go past that, um, but that does conclude public participation. <laughs>
<laughs> public participation. <laughs> That's what I like. I do have, and I, I am going to break the quorum. I do have one question: Is is are the students going to be submitting comments to the? Um, yes, the, the students have met, and Ms. Drake heads our history club. Um, but the students have met to um, to prepare formal co uh, comments to be supported to be presented to the Mississippi Department of Education. They're also reaching out to their social networks students at other schools to encourage them to get involved as well and to be able to submit comments that would benefit our district. Tomorrow they're going to be interviewed, I believe, um, by one of the news stations so that they can provide some additional responses, you know, on behalf of students just like them. So, so my next question would be, and I, I understand how deadlines go in submissions, would it be possible for the board to get an advanced copy? And it's not, not to stop it, but I also am wondering if there's an opportunity to endorse it. Um, and, and I don't want to promise action, but, you know, I, I, and board members, feel free to weigh in here on this, this, um, what your thoughts might be on something of this nature. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I completely agree. And as someone who, as a career, works as a civil rights historian at Jackson State, I've been deeply concerned about uh, the proposed changes in social study standards. And I'm grateful to see your scholars engaging this process in the way they have. And I w would uh, completely uh, support that, Dr. Sivak, and uh, would even be happy to talk with the students and, and the teacher as well. The deadline is Friday uh, of this week for submission, and I believe they already have some comments that they're going to be wrapping up on tomorrow, but we want to definitely encourage the community to get involved. So I think the State Department of Education is looking at the preponderance <laughs> of responses, and so we want to make sure that everybody's voice is heard because this is very, very important. And students feel like they're losing a piece of their history that they, they talked about maybe uh, their children won't be aware of what Jim Crow, the Jim Crow era would be like or, or um, taxes that had to be paid in order to be able to vote or all these things that happened. They're afraid of losing a piece of their history and they want to be a part of a movement to address that, at least have their voices heard. Thank you. Other board members, any other thoughts? I just want to say this is excellent leadership, and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, and I echo what uh, Attorney Johnson has said, that it is excellent leadership. And I love it when young people take the lead, because sometimes, you know, us more seasoned folk, you know, we lag behind for various reasons. Mm -hmm. But you out front on that one, God bless you and stay strong. <laughs> Thank you all. And, and it is students and youth that push a movement forward. Yes. I say it is t students and youth. A lot of the civil rights was led by our young people. And so I'm so excited to hear that and hear their passion. I mean, just incredible. Incredible, and you're incredible anyway. So, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Evans. Thank you all. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, board members, if we haven't gotten enough students yet, we now get to hear from our high school student board representative from Lanier. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Marshall Thomas. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we have an opportunity to meet Ms. Mackenzie Edwards. Mackenzie is a senior at Lanier High School. She also serves as the 2021-2022 Miss Lanier High School. Mackenzie is a part of the Lanier High School Student Government Association, um, the Cheer Squad, and the National Honor Society. Her goals and aspirations are to major in business administration at the I Love, as well as enlist in the United States Air Force. Mackenzie's motivation is a quote from Walt Disney, 
The difference between winning and losing is most often not quitting. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, Mackenzie Edwards. Kenzie Edwards, and today I will bring I will bring your greetings from the newest address of excellence, Lanier High School. Today I will be discussing my chosen board policy, JS. Okay. JSCA mandatory school uniform dress code policies and procedures. <laughs> Please hold all questions until the end of my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see on my first slide, I introduced the already board approved uniform policies, which states all elementary and middle school drivers must wear uniforms. It promotes academic success in a positive environment, and I totally agree. Can you go back to the next slide, please? Thank you. Updating this policy. I honestly feel that this policy needs to be admitted and revised. I think that we as high school scholars can benefit from uni the uniform policy. I agree that the school climate and the environment should be focused on safety and academics, not the latest fashions. Next slide, please. Support evidence. By wearing school uniforms for the high school scholars, I support school unity and support. The level of playing field of having to fit in and it can most definitely remove any distractions. Next slide, please. Closing remarks. The JSCA mandatory school uniform dress code policies and procedures should be revised to assist with making schools safer for students. Creating the level playing field that reduces social economic disparities and encourages school, high school scholars into focus the academic studies and success rather than aesthetic factors. And this includes my presentations. Any questions? Thank you. So I, first of all, excellent presentation and, and it was a very well argued, um, it was a very well structured argument. Um, what would the reaction be in, in your high school if we changed the dress code policy? Actually, I feel like they would react. They would be very mad. But I feel like <laughs> some students would be happy because they would be able to afford the school uniforms. I would be happy too if I was in high school. I would be able to afford it. I wouldn't be worried about anyone bullying me about if I'm gonna wear the new V-Long shirt today or tomorrow, the new Nike outfit. Like, I would be happy to wear the uniform. Thank you. Mm. You're welcome. Board members, other questions, comments? Well, I don't um, have a question, but I do have a comment. Knowing that you think that most of the students would be upset over this, I think this is very brave of you to bring it and present it to the board. Very Thank brave. You. When you started out, I wanted to say, I told her, I said, I agree with you. I've been agreeing for a long time. <laughs> However, um, you know, I, my, I had seven children, and I don't think any of them <laughs> wanted to do the uniform thing when they got to high school. So I just wonder, like, what that would be like introducing that kind of uh, restriction. 
It would, it would be shocking, but eventually they would accept it, I feel like. Yeah, figure it out. They That's would. It. They would. They would. They work with it. <laughs> and I love your jacket. Thank you. Board <laughs> <laughs> well, members, I, I actually um, have a, a question for you. Um, so, so I too am, am just awed by, thank you for the, the way you structured your argument and, and um, the presentation here, um, and the fact that you know that you believe that there would be lots of resistance to this and you're still recommending it. Like others have said, I think that shows just a great deal of strength and leadership. So I want to call that out and, and be real clear about that. Thank you for your leadership in that way. Um, as we, as you talked about, one of the a part of your argument was around um, reducing or levy, leveling the playing field and reducing bullying. <clears throat> I know there was a bit of that when I was in school, some you know, a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> how much of that, just for those who, those of us who've been away for a little bit, how much of that happens now? Bullying around clothing what you wear and is it in style or, or any of that. How much of that do you think happens? How, how frequently does that happen? This happens every class period. <laughs> All the time. 25-8. Mm. Oh, <laughs> oh my. Oh my. 24-7 doesn't do. 25-8. <laughs> Question asked and answered. Thank you. <laughs> In case y'all didn't know, that's my niece. Oh, yes. oh that's your niece. That, that explains it. <laughs> As she walks out. Yeah. That's it. All right, board members. 25. Eight. <laughs> What's your problem? Why don't you know this? <laughs> Please. All right, well that concludes our student reports. Um, and it was, it was great. It was great to have students in the boardroom tonight from so many different facets of our, of our community. Um, so with that, we will move on to our bond update. And Ms. Robinson and, um, and Ms. Franklin, I believe, will be up here to present. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Board President Dr. Sivak, board members, uh, Dr. Green. At the first board meeting of each month, we have the pleasure of presenting the, bo the bond update on the status of the construction projects. In tonight's presentation, we'll provide an update on the construction progress, the projected board, board action dates on remaining projects, an uh, update on the financial report, and also um, giving you some updates on upcoming ribbon cutting events. Ms. Franklin is going to start us off with um, the update on the construction projects. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, tonight, we'll start um, by taking a look at our construction progress at our various schools. <clears throat> we'll begin on the campus of Forest Hill High School. Um, there, uh, this is our JRLTC building that's under a full renovation. Uh, this building uh, solely serves the JRLTC program. It's uh, received a complete gut in the uh, interior. Uh, all openings have been moved, block walls removed. Uh, the new configuration will house an, a drill area, exercise area, six classrooms, four offices, locker rooms, and um, updated restrooms. Also at Forest Hill, we have a performing arts project that's in progress. And this project includes uh, renovation of the band hall. The carpet in that uh, particular building was completely removed and replaced. Uh, the lighting was updated to LED lights. The mirrors on the walls were replaced. 
and in the band director's office and the instrument storage rooms. The flooring there was replaced also with luxury vinyl tile and both restrooms in the band hall um, are also being renovated. This performing arts renovation also includes the renovation of the auditorium. Here we're taking a look at the stage lighting that's been replaced. Also the stage will uh, be get refinished. Uh, we'll have new uh, lighting in the audience, new seating, new flooring in those spaces as well. This renovation also includes renovating two of our art classrooms. At Hughes Field, uh, we're undergoing a complete renovation there also. The photo on the left is the slab that's been poured for our new ticket booth and concession stand. The two photos on the right is um, excavation for the new drainage system for the artificial turf. And this slide here, um, the existing three buildings on that site are also being complete, have been completely gutted. Um, they'll receive up updated plumbing, a new configuration in each of those, and we're also increasing the capacity of the plumbing fixtures to accommodate a larger crowd. At Brinkley Middle School, we have restroom renovations in progress there. <clears throat> the photo on the left, um, one of the electrical panels there has been replaced, and this panel serves the auditorium, the lobby, and front office area. The two photos on the right are of a girls' restroom. The plumbing inside there has been updated, and contractors have moved on to installing the ceramic wall tile. At Chastain Middle School, we have three sets of restrooms that are being renovated there. Contractors have only started on one set. On um, the photo on the left, we see we're looking in the plumbing chase. Um, all of the structural wall carriers have been updated. The plumbing has been updated. On the right, we're actually inside one of the restrooms, and we see it's been completely gutted. At Powell Middle School, we have four sets of restrooms there that are being renovated. Contractors have currently started on two sets. In these photos, we're looking at a girls' and boys' restroom where the structural wall carriers are being replaced. All of the plumbing inside those walls is being updated, and uh, the metal studs are being installed. At Marshall Elementary School, uh, two sets of restrooms in the courtyards there have been renovated. They've received all new epoxy floors, uh, new solid plastic partitions, LED lighting, all new plumbing fixtures, ceramic wall tile, and new accessories. Also at Marshall, um, they've received all new exterior doors. These are egress doors from the classrooms that are in the courtyard. Um, previously, they were wood doors. They've re been replaced with metal doors and new hardware. At North Jackson Elementary School, in previous bond updates, we've seen where the carpet was removed um, here, um, contractors have finished installing the flooring throughout the corridors, and they're still working in the classroom pods. At Oak Forest Elementary School, um, they've received new exterior doors also, um, and these are egress doors from the classrooms. In the photo on the left, we saw these doors led, to, led out to wooden walkways, um, and they've been replaced with uh, permanent concrete sidewalks in the courtyards. At Oak Forest, they've also have some exterior improvements. This photo on the left shows um, the parking lot that's adjacent to the cafeteria. It had numerous potholes. It's been repaved. Uh, we've received new exterior lighting there, as well as um, drainage improvements in the courtyard. At Rains Elementary, uh, restroom renovations are in progress there. And this includes two group restrooms, two sets of uh, group toilets, as well as the classroom toilets and classroom millwork. Here in the uh, photo on the left, this is the previous condition of the classroom millwork. The two photos on the right show the new base cabinets, solid surface countertops, and new sinks. At Smith Elementary School, um, this is the second set of restrooms that have been completed. Um, they've received all new plumbing fixtures, LED lighting, epoxy flooring, uh, solid surface partitions, and new accessories. 
Um, in the next slides, uh, Ms. Robinson will give us an update on our board action timeline, our financials, and our upcoming events. So I know we're excited to continue to see the progress that we're making on our um, bond projects. Um, board members, on previous uh, updates, I have provided a, a board uh, action timeline for the final three major projects, that's Wales APAC, Newell Field, and the baseball and softball fields. Previously, we did anticipate being able to come to the board uh, sooner, but um, due to some um, um, illnesses with some staff, we weren't able to advertise Wells APAC and Newell Field as quickly as we had thought. The projects are advertising starting this week, and we will be having an early March uh, bid opening for those projects, and we will, we'll, we will be coming to the, to the board in the second board meeting in March for action on Wells APAC and Newell Field. For baseball softball uh, fields, um, we did have to do a survey of the entire um, a hardy area to make sure everything, um, you know, drainage wise and uh, site wise was included in the um, design. That survey was completed the 1st of January. We are, um, we'll be, we will be receiving construction documents this week and we will start advertising the end of February. And we will, we will be coming to the board in April um, for board action on that project. And that will complete the uh, final major three projects with the bond as far as coming to the board for action. Each month we provide an update on the financials. Um, the orange shows the amount expended and we're happy to see that amount continue to grow. So uh, expended, we are now at 68.8% expended. So that's up from 556 from the last bond update. And as of February 1st, we have ex expended or encumbered 80% 86% of the funds. The next three slides give a school by school breakout with the budget expenditures, the encumbered amounts, and the remaining budget balance. I won't read through those three, these three slides. Now the, the update that is in your um, previous bond uh, work materials was as of a January report. So, but the bond financials in this slide we will we will uh, give you a hard copy as of, is as of February 1st, 2022. Now we're excited that we are planning ribbon cutting ceremonies for schools that have had significant upgrades. Uh, those being Forest Hill High School will be the first one next week on Tuesday, February the 8th. Northwest Middle School, Tuesday, March 8th. Green Elementary School, Tuesday, March 22nd. And Callaway High School, Thursday, March 31st. Um, we are working with um, public engagement. They are providing, um, working with the principals and we'll be getting out information to the public and um, as far as the details of that. So we're excited to be able to open up the schools, some of those areas and see in person um, the improvements that have been made at these schools. That concludes our presentation. If you, do you have any more questions? Thank you, Ms. Robinson and Ms. Franklin. Board members, are there any questions, comments? I only have one comment to say, as I often do, how uh, this progress is so wonderful to see and to have ribbon cuttings. That's going to be exciting. So thank you and your team so much for this good work. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. And um, I will be mis meeting with Mr. Walker with his concerns. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was, if, are there any questions? Okay, okay. so okay. yeah, I thank you for saying that. It's like, mm, we don't need to skirt around that. So we've got a whole list of concerns here and public comment, and we just spoke to um, uh, restrooms. So it, even if we just focus on restrooms, is there more that we can share now publicly since we've reported on restrooms at, at uh, Palo? There are um, questions as far as about changes in scope and that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Included in the bid for Powell were restroom renovations and also window replacements. Um, the funding for um, Powell was originally $630,000. We were able to um, award a bid that was over $730,000. So we were able to get some additional um, projects uh, scope done at um, Powell. So the, 
windows that will, will be replaced are those in the restrooms. We are targeting extra funds to do the complete scope of work of the school just due to the size and the amount that was allocated in the, in the bond. We were not able to do all the window replacements that were um, at the school. Um, we are, um, there were some concerns with some lighting. Um, our staff have been um, there today as far as making those repairs of interior lighting. Um, I'm trying to think what else was on the list. That's fine. We can address other things as appropriate. Just you spoke to restrooms here, and there was a specific concern to restrooms that yes. was stated. So I wanted you to speak to that. Um, is there an expectation, just in terms of um, further projects, further projects related, uh, further projects um, supported through ESER funds? Is there an expectation that we can? Establish with board or with the community as to like how those will be, yes. when those will be discussed. We've uh, identified um, in this the ARP uh, SR three application that hasn't been approved yet, but we have identified additional window replacements and restroom in, restroom renovations and also um, HVAC upgrades at Powell. Okay. So let's let's talk through when we can more explicitly share with community those things that have been specifically called out and can be funded through those dollars, just so that folks have a clearer sense of yeah. what can be done, even with those dollars and and our timeline, our uh, thinking about when we get that done. Yes, sir. I'll be working with Dr. Merritt to make sure we have uh, the timeline after the application is uh, approved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. All right, board members. Um, next, we will move on to our consent agenda for finance. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda item for finance? So moved. Second. Dr. Aye. Luckett has moved. Ms. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? There being none. Aye. Thank you. There being none, the motion is approved. Next, we have the consent agenda item for general. Uh, all consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda item for general? So moved. Second. Mrs. Johnson is moved. Dr. Luckett is seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. Next, we have the consent agenda item for personnel. All of the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously. We've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda for personnel? So moved. Second. Mrs. Johnson has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays to being done, the motion is approved. Next, board members, I did receive an executive session item late in the day, um, and so did you want to, well, Luke, so we need a motion to consider going into executive session. I move that we close the meeting to consider going into executive session. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Mrs. Johnson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. Thank you, everyone, for Good turning night, out tonight. I like sharing, it's fun. I like this cheer team. We are what I consider a hybrid squad. So we master what is considered traditional cheer and what's considered stomp and shake cheer. So this national competition is what is considered by some traditional cheer. However, here at Jim Hill High School, everything is tradition for us because we learn, we work hard and we master all forms of competition, all forms of cheer so that no matter where we go and where we perform, we can provide uh, the best performance possible. So this competition, it does mean a lot to us because we're able to broaden our horizons and show not just people in the Jackson area, but people in the state and the nation that a group of young ladies from an urban area can compete across genres, across states, across the country.